In this other picture, we see uh, an action uh, out of plane failure that uh, sometimes uh, the forces from the roof will move the wall out of uh, its plane and, and we get this kind of behavior. So the study region we are considering in this study is um, located in Bogota. Specifically, we have uh, here, have located Colombia in the map. As you can see, we have some activity, earthquake activity. We have subduction on the Pacific area. Uh, we have also some faulting uh, <clears throat> that is uh, in, the, in the mountains of the Andes. Here I'm showing a, a plan of uh, Bogota. This is a plan view uh, of Bogota. And this part here are the mountains. This is a model we built with a PhD student, which has um, a lot of thousands of finite elements. So we were able to propagate an earthquake that happens uh, by the mountains and it will arrive to the city. The city is in a flat area that is mainly uh, have a lot of deposits of soil, uh, very soft soil. So we see that the actions and state within the deposit, although in the, at the mountains we don't see much activity afterwards. So this is a, a view of the city and in the part near the mountains we have uh, this town which is mainly built with earth, adobe and ramp earth, uh, mainly. So here, this is how it looks like. So uh, we did a study of this historical center, um, found that uh, here you can uh, see with the colors, one story buildings in blue, and uh, in green, two story buildings. So there are a lot of two story buildings in, the, in this town and also the one story <clears throat> are, all these properties are made of earth. So here we see the thickness of the walls. The thickness uh, varies around, uh, I would say 0.60 meters, 60 centimeters for one story buildings and for two stories. So a little more for the first story walls. We did, um, models of all these houses and we have those in Revit. So uh, with that, we have a, a good um, cover of the architecture features that are present in these houses. Um, afterwards, we have conducted research in, on this uh, behavior of these houses and also some measures for retrofitting. So the, all these studies have been published already so I'm showing here some of the paper that we have published uh, in the time that this document is very important because it's the regulation we wrote uh, based on the results of these studies. And you see here some more recent research on this topic. Uh, these are 2023 papers, the, the last ones. So first we study the material properties. We have conducted so many tests on this uh, material for the adobe itself, uh, compression flexion for uh, compression wallets, for um, ram earth, uh, taking some <clears throat> um, blocks and getting the mechanical properties for compression, uh, diagonal tension and for adobe and ram earth. All these tests uh, have been conducted for many of the um, research uh, projects that we have conducted in the time. Um, the retrofitting techniques that we were evaluating at the beginning were very low cost techniques like installing these meshes. This is a technique uh, developed mainly in Peru. Um, they use a very low cost uh, mesh and attach it with some caps uh, to the wall. Um, very simple um, way to, to retrofit the, the, the walls. Also, we have been working with uh, other meshes with high cost meshes, um, metallic or some other plastic or synthetic uh, meshes that are um, attached to the wall through a ball that is passing through the thickness of the wall. 
We also have tried uh, timber elements. The timber elements have a process to install it in which you need to carve the wall. This is not very good for the wall because we reduce the thickness a little bit. Uh, but we need to do this because we don't want the elements to be uh, shown uh, from the outside. So we would like to cover that. Uh, so that's why we need to do something like this. And we install the full out bolts to connect both uh, sides of the timber elements. And recently we have also worked on steel plates uh, uh, the problems with the uh, timber elements are mainly related with the durability, especially because of the humidity that these walls will have during the whole time that they exist. Um, also, um, uh, we would like to have something with uh, better strength. One argument to not using um, steel plate was mainly related with the incompatibility between the earth material and the steel. And that's something that is very clear when you use a very thick or uh, stiff steel elements. But when you don't use that, but only a plate, uh, you will see a lot of compatibility between the two materials. Also, these are connected through the wall. The experimental testing was conducted at Universidad de Los Andes. Uh, this is our lab. Uh, we have a shaking table, uh, reaction wall. Also, uh, recently we have been working with uh, Pontificia Universidad Javeriana. Especially, I have a PhD student who works for that university. So we have been doing testing also at that university. So initially we do uh, this kind of testing in which we apply horizontal load to measure the implant capacity of the walls. We see in Adobe a lot of cracks, while when you go to, for example, Rampers, um, uh, you see only some cracks that it will show up. And then uh, you get, uh, for example, in this case, this big part of the wall will get unstable eventually. So that's the way that uh, these big blocks of ramp earth will eventually collapse. So then we have been doing uh, implant testing for one story walls with openings. So to simulate the front of the houses, you see the doors and the windows. So we take this kind of geometry to the lab, install it there and apply load, loads horizontally to see the capacity in this case. And we also retrofit some of these with, uh, for example, timber elements like you can see here. So the main advantage of this system is that you see that the cracks will not be able to propagate extensively. They will appear, but they will be controlled by the, these uh, timber elements that we have installed. We see here uh, the big differences in behavior between the two cases, between the cases without uh, retrofitting. The original one is this one. And then retrofitted, you see uh, a lot of increase, especially in the deformation capacity of the wall, and also some increase in the strength. But the most important one is in the formation capacity. Also for Adobe walls, you see here has the hysteresis cycles that are um, uh, fatter uh, and also they will go to larger deformation uh, displacements. Um, in this case, you can see the profile of displacements along the wall. So you see that there is a concentration of displacement in this position. So when you have this opening, you will concentrate the damage mainly on these piers. So that's something that uh, called our attention in terms of the retrofitting technique that we should include elements there. We also have conducted tests on this kind of uh, models with windows and doors uh, in which we, you can see here that the cracks are not, uh, they appear, but they are controlled by the timber elements. Here also we have doing the testing for peers because we observe that this peer is very critical in behavior. 
uh, as you can see, the peer will have the typical uh, X pattern cracking that um, is present in meson restructures. So here you see this and this. These are those two specimens, similar failure modes. However, when we tested out of plane, we didn't see any damage. And we were very surprised because uh, we were thinking that there will be uh, star damaging at the same time that these other two specimens. But then suddenly the specimen collapses. So that we observed was that inside the wall, we didn't see the damage, but it was all the material inside, it was highly damaged. So eventually it lost the, cap the vertical capacity. So we try to um, retrofit this kind of uh, walls. In this case, we put a, oh, yeah. need to change the, Um, in this, um, this is without the retrofitting, and here we put some plates, uh, and you see how these uh, plates will prevent these large cracks to appear. So we have damage in the lower part of the specimen, but in general, the capacity, the deformation capacity is much higher than the other, um, than the other wall. Also, we have done uh, some kind of beams. These are actually out of plane walls that we install horizontally to see the behavior, out of plane behavior. Without reformance like the wall here, uh, we need to reduce the span of the, of the specimen. So we are able to actually see the failure because otherwise with the self weight, it will fail without any additional weight. So in this case, uh, we put these uh, um, elements to support the specimen before the test, and then we remove it and apply some little load, and you will see that the element will collapse immediately. In the specimen down here, we put uh, in the, at the bottom and at the top, we put some steel plates and connect those plates with, wall, with uh, bolts between them. So you see the behavior in this case is more similar to reinforced concrete in which you see a cracking pattern. Um, some cracks appear and they are controlled by the reinforcement. So the specimen will have a much larger strength and also the most important deformation capacity. So uh, this uh, was uh, apparently a very simple test, but it, it was not because we need to build this like opposite and then rotate at the lab. It was not very simple test actually. Um, with this, we, we have some, we did some testing, a lot of, of this. We were able to build a curve that uh, will allow us to estimate or to get an equation to predict the flexural capacity of an earthen wall with these plates included. Uh, this equation, it was verified experimentally and also analytically. So it works very well. Um, also with this on out of plane testing, uh, using a very simplistic way, they take the wall completely and then put it in an angle. And with the angle, try to measure the out of plane acceleration that we may have. So these are the results. This is a low adobe wall at the top uh, is collapsed have collapsed after uh, just rotating a little bit the, 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 the framework that we have for the test. Here we put some timber elements and as you observe, the timber element will control the collapse, out of plane collapse of this Adobe uh, world. We also did some testing for the connection. We would like to know what is the behavior of the connection and the compatibility between the two materials, considering the ball that is uh, passing the wall so we did this test to get some properties for our analytical model that we did for the flexural behavior uh, uh, that we have before. We needed to have some kind of the interaction between the material and the earth 
So we conducted this test to do that. Okay. Later, uh, we uh, start thinking that we should do uh, the same testing for two-story structure because as you saw in Bogota, we have so many two-story structures that we have tested only one story. So then we came out with this specimen. This is um, a PhD student here, Daniel Ruiz. He is from the Pontificia Universidad Javeriana. Uh, so we did the testing over there. And yet uh, at the top are two of uh, two students that participated in the project. Uh, they are master students. And the guy here at the door is the one who built this world. It is, it is a very well-known person uh, that uh, knows all these techniques from the past and, and is able to build this kind of uh, houses uh, using the very old techniques. So here is how the world uh, behave. Here we have some cracking as we expected here at the pier on the second floor. At the first floor, we didn't get much damage. We then installed some retrofitting for the wall and then tested again. And here is the behavior. So with the retrofitting element, you see uh, how the wall will have a very large deformation capacity. You see the very large displacement that we are applying with the two actuators uh, along the wall. So very good behavior, uh, high capacity, deformation capacity, and also some increase in strength. As I mentioned before, the increase in strength is not as high as the increase in deformation capacity. So uh, here you can see the um, uh, text. Oh, sorry. Here you can see the hysteresis loop similar to the one I just showed before. We also did some checking table testing. Uh, Initially, a uh, small scale, a uh, very, sorry, it's not, um, um, so here we are applying an earthquake and we see the collapse pattern of these kind of houses. This is a small scale specimen. We have put some timber elements to see the improvement in the behavior. So in general, uh, we got very good result. We also test this for two stories, uh, small scale. And, but uh, these tests are interesting, but not very good to get information out of them. So then we decided to go to full scale specimens. So uh, we want, uh, we will have seen, this is a picture for an earthquake uh, that the corner is a very critical point for the out of plane actions in this kind of houses. So we would like to have in the lab one of these corners. So we build these specimens. Here we were able to put on the checking table uh, three specimens at the same time uh, with different techniques. The first one here, it doesn't have anything. It's Adobe wall. The Adobe for this and for the previous elements that we have built in the lab were obtained from uh, places that were under demolition and demolition. So the Adobe are preserved for maybe 50, 100 years or more than that. So you see here the um, damage in the perpendicular wall and also in the wall that is on the, the out of plane actions. And one interesting thing that we see here is that the walls that are uh, retrofitted didn't suffer any damage while this was collapsing. So this is a, was a very good evidence, the advantages of the retrofitting techniques. Here, the other wall is already uh, just, it doesn't exist anymore. And these walls too, this, these two here are uh, with some very little damage, very stable. Also, we did testing for RAM Earth structure. Other techniques are included here, for example, this one include steel plates. You see the big cracking uh, cracks that appear through the wall, the very extensive damage that is suffered by this wall. We see here collapse already. As you can see in this other video, uh, this support of the block here is almost uh, 
you know, you see this, this block here is not supported under the um, below block. So, so this, um, this is the way we observe it in many of the experiments that this will get unstable eventually and it will collapse completely. Um, we also tested uh, this with the uh, meshes. These are the meshes that we tested, uh, the very good quality, high cost meshes. Uh, however, as you can see in this experiment, the um, flexibility of the walls are very high. And at the end of the experiment, the walls will have a very high permanent displacements. So this is an interesting technique that will allow people to get out of the houses, but probably the houses will be demolished after the earthquake because of the very high permanent displacement that will remain in the walls. Some simulations also, also have been conducted in many different software uh, like OpenSeas or even uh, we have done this with um, Abacus. Uh, as you can see here, this wall is collapsing here out of plane. And this uh, retrofitting uh, specimen uh, at the bottom, it doesn't have collapse and the walls are very well, behave very well in this case. Uh, finally, we have done a testing of two story specimens uh, subjected to two components of ground motion, as you can see here. So here we see an specimen. Uh, in the left, uh, without retro, uh, any reinforcement, and at the right, with reinforcement, we see the collapse of this specimen here, and this one here is uh, with some damage, but yes, it behaves very well, very stable, uh, no permanent displacements uh, that are important. Uh, here is how, the, at the end, uh, it was uh, with a complete collapse of this specimen without re reinforcement. Finally, uh, I would like to show some applications. Uh, the first application that I uh, would like to show is uh, this document, uh, the AIS 610. This document uh, was prepared by um, uh, some people in Colombia. I was part of that group. Uh, I was actually leading this part of retrofitting uh, and we have included some of the results of all this research in this document, and this document is now a standard for the seismic retrofit of uh, historic buildings made of earth. Uh, we would like to have this kind of uh, initiatives also for other materials. We are now working uh, with the um, ministry, uh, ministry of Culture in uh, masonry, conventional masonry structures that are very old. Uh, this document award the 2020 Diodoro Sanchez Award from the Colombian Society of Engineers. And also these techniques are now implemented in some uh, cases here, for example, they are also retrofitting the diaphragm, very important for connecting uh, the walls between them and be able to uh, take advantage of the <clears throat> over uh, the redistribution of the forces when you have an earthquake. Um, so that's all that I had. Thank you so much for your attention. I don't know if there are any Thank you very much, Juan Carlos, for an excellent presentation. I'm sure that's very stimulating, actually, and it's very nice to see how the, um, all the research has then fed into actual applications. Um, and now the research has been refined from, you know, using both experimental and analytical approaches. Um, are there questions from the audience, please? Feel free to switch on your camera and open your mic, or if you want to write in the chat. Um, I have a first question, uh, it, while we maybe others are uh, thinking about it. So in, in the very early um, the examples you presented, 
uh, case of this bracing or confinement, because it, it's almost the way to the confinement that one would uh, apply in a confined masonry, uh, traditional confined masonry structure, um, with uh, timber plate. If you are using this as a retrofit, how do you create the recess in the adobe uh, to put the timber plate at the same surface level as you were showing in those pictures? So uh, we need to uh, initially carve over the wall. This wall uh, has uh, mainly 60 centimeters thick. So we need to carve a little bit to be able to um, enter the elements uh, some amount. So then we can put some uh, covering uh, so the elements are not visible uh, mm. because in these uh, kind of structures, they, they mainly want to have the same appearance. Uh, actually, at the restaurant uh, of our university, uh, you probably go in there, Dina, when you come here, uh, you can, we, we implemented this technique, but in some parts, we discovered and uh, uh, the the, uh, the elements, the retrofitting elements, so you can see then uh, how they are uh, connected and supported. Uh, so, so that's something that we, we need to do ahead, is this carving, carving the wall a little bit. So that's why this technique of these elements, we um, <coughs> found it a little, a little bit invasive <coughs> because, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> <coughs> Long talk. Yeah, I need to. We need to take some some material out of the wall. So so, um, although it works very well in the lab, uh, we uh, actually would like to have other techniques like the steel plates that are very uh, thin. Yeah, very thin, and then they not. We don't need to to to. And play. how do you connect them through the thickness? Ah, oh, we uh, first we um, drill a hole, and we mm -hmm. put a bolt uh, to connect the two the two elements uh, in both sides of the wall. Uh, with the with with the timber elements, we need to pull um, uh, um, the bolts uh, with nuts at the end, and so they will also take some space. Those nuts, uh, of course. Uh, with the steel, uh, we uh, welded the element to the plate. So mm -hmm. we didn't need uh, the additional space for the nut. Thank you for, the, for providing these details. And, um, there is a question from Arturo Martinez. How are those vertical retrofit elements connected to the foundations? Yeah, that's, that's a very important question and a very interesting and very nice that you have asked that. Um, the, we have two um, ideas. Uh, one idea is that uh, you have these horizontal rings that will uh, go around the construction. So if the walls are not very long, uh, these horizontal rings will be able to support the out-of-plane actions. So we don't need a strong connection to the foundation. Uh, but if the wall is very long, uh, then uh, the rings are not enough to support the out-of-plane action. So you need to put some, uh, the vertical elements need to be anchored to the foundation. So locally, we need to do some uh, small uh, elements of the foundation, but we didn't put like uh, beams out of you know in all the walls of the of the uh, of the construction because that is uh, we have in the past we have we did that in some projects but it is is very uh, we we like damage the whole construction and the the details and everything so for now that we are doing is doing uh, making a, a, some foundation very local for those very long walls to be able to uh, anchorage the vertical elements. And uh, we think that the rings horizontally will help uh, so the actions are not that concentrated on those vertical elements. Thank you very much, Juan Carlos. And um, I don't know if there are other questions. 
from the one final question for me is how does um, how do you think that that uh, extends to other type of mesory structures? We will see in a little while that, for instance, in uh, Nepal, they have uh, developed a very similar layout of horizontal and, and vertical elements uh, that uh, usually they are installed in a shot grid, so with uh, reinforcement for um, brickwork. Or and in some cases also for stonework, and I think, I, of course, the concept is the same, but the the difference is fundamentally in the relative stiffnesses of the materials. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, these uh, techniques, um, are in general, as you know, the strength of the original material is very important. The strength and the stiffness of the original material. So for this case, for the adobe and the ramp earth, we have, we, we, I mean, we consider that we have the, like the weakest possible masonry system. Yes. So uh, for, for that uh, case, I think we need to put more elements and invert a lot of more money because the material itself is very weak. Uh, in other cases for conventional masonry, uh, that is not uh, Adobe or RAM Earth. Uh, I see other techniques may, may be um, more appealing or maybe may, may be used or no, we don't need so many elements as, as you saw in this case. Uh, for example, one, one thing that I didn't mention but we did in the lab was why not we put inside the wall some elements, we drill a hole inside the wall and put some, let's say, some bars, steel bars, and then try to compress the wall. Do you know that that looks like something interesting? Because in masonry, in conventional masonry, that's something typical. We drill a hole inside, uh, and then we put some elements to for retrofitting. Yes, to improve the the bending strength with some pre-compression. Yes, of exactly. Course. Like like doing this um, reinforced masonry, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, but for this material, uh, we did it. We did put it in the checking table, and actually, it failed before the other walls. They didn't yes. have any retrofitting because yeah. the material is very weak and actually uh, uh, damaged the wall even more. You <laughs> initiate Poisson ratio in the other direction, so yes, exactly. it, yeah. it's clearly it, it clearly doesn't quite work. Yes. Um, indeed, there are, there are um, in the Nepalese code, there are some recommendations to introduce this, uh, uh, um, this vertical reinforcement at corners, but of course, it's better to, it's easier to do during construction than as a retrofitting measure, because as a retrofitting measure, the drilling becomes very complicated. Um, thank you again very much. Uh, we love to hear from other colleagues that are online. So please keep uh, either switch your microphone on or, or type your questions in the chat. And meanwhile, Juan Carlos, thank you very much again for the very interesting uh, presentations and uh, lecture. And I will uh, pass the words to Roy uh, Adikari uh, that will talk about strengthening and retrofitting of masonry structures. Thank you again, Juan Carlos. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much, Dina. And thank you, Juan Carlos, for a very interesting um, presentation on the experimental tests on uh, retrofitting of Adobe. Um, you will see in my presentation, let me see my slides. Uh, you will see many uh, uh, shared uh, concepts and techniques in my presentations. Um, um, because the deficiencies we saw yesterday on the on the masonry buildings, on the enforced masonry buildings in general are, are very similar throughout different masonry fabrics. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. So uh, based on the deficiencies we identified yesterday, looking at different uh, history of different earthquakes, the damage to masonry buildings, uh, we will 
uh, today um, see some of the most commonly used techniques uh, to strengthen masonry buildings. Um, so this is the content. Uh, we will briefly look at the deficiencies we identified yesterday. Um, and we will present, uh, we will talk about uh, some of the most common retrofitting techniques. Then I will show two examples of uh, strengthening uh, with detailed analytical and numerical assessment before and after uh, retrofitting. And we will uh, present some key points uh, uh, around retrofitting of masonry structures. So the deficiencies we saw yesterday are uh, at three levels, uh, wall level deficiencies, as you can see, uh, and then at cross wall level deficiencies um, and the global deficiencies. And we will see the strengthening uh, targeted for each of these three level of uh, deficiencies in masonry buildings. Um, at wall level deficiencies, we have the poor integrity, poor material quality within the walls, poor connections with, uh, within the leaves and so on. So one, one of the retrofitting at wall level is to, uh, to, to put through elements. For example, here, uh, they have made some holes through the masonry and put uh, a reinforcement bar and then with some, some concreting there. So this is, uh, is, there was discussion just before in, the, in Juan Carlos presentations. Um, this is quite uh, destructive and uh, needs careful attention when drilling those holes through the masonry so as not to disturb or vibrate and lose the bonding of the uh, elements in the wall. And similar to this, there are um, um, transversal anchors through elements again, uh, were made of steel only, and they are locked from the two sides, as you can see in these examples. And these have been used in both stone and brick masonry. Um, again, at one level, so if the, if the material, the, especially the binder, the mortar, if it is uh, of poor quality or it has been lost or disintegrated um, after a long time, then then this this grout injection can be used to regain the bonding uh, in the in the masonry. So in this process as well, they create small holes and then inject the grout through the through the masonry. Another technique here is uh, to use the ferro cement. So there is a layer of a layer of reinforcement on the wall. So usually so in, in Nepalese practice they put the uh, jackets on both sides and then they 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 uh, connect it through the thickness of the wall at, at a uh, continuous level. Um, now at cross wall level, when, when we need a proper connection between two walls, uh, this is one of the techniques where there is a strong back holding uh, uh, constructed right at the corner. It, 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 it can be best placed inside and with a new foundation for it, not, not a big uh, uh, deep foundation, but at least to, to support it vertically. And this strong back is connected by jowls uh, on, on the both side walls, as you can see. So get the pointer. For example, here, this connects this wall and this, this dowel here, this connects the other wall. So, and it serves two purposes here. So for the low strength masonry, the, the vertical column imparts some lateral strength and it also imparts the, the uh, good cross wall connection. Um, again, at cross wall connection, we can use the same ferro cement, the RC wall jacketing technique at the cross wall. So it binds all the walls there uh, together. And this is also uh, again uh, on the both sides of the wall and interconnected through the through the masonry at, at certain intervals. Um, as Juan Carlos was uh, showing on the Adobe, so these are some of the practice we can see from different parts of the world. So in Adobe, we have uh, quite large thickness, um, 500, 600 millimeters. So we have space uh, there to carve 
the place for putting the those connectors, either uh, tin mirror or steel connectors, as you can see in the in the photographs. So these are traditionally practiced, uh, maybe mostly without any engineering um, analysis or calculations there. In terms of global strengthening, um, so these are low cost practices, as you can see, uh, PP bands and uh, so on Adobe buildings. So PP bands uh, mess all over the uh, wall faces and then plastering also using the mud. And on your on your on your right, uh, you can see some bamboo uh, vertical elements, and they are used to support uh, the 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 rope joints so that the rope binds all the walls together. In in low strength, the Adobe or rammed earth structures here, this this bamboo vertical bamboo posts also um, uh, to some extent uh, impart uh, lateral uh, resistance. And here is again the, the ferro cement overlay, the RC jacketing. And now in this case, this has been applied throughout the walls, all the walls. Um, and th this, this vertical reinforcement bars, these also have uh, a small foundation uh, dog at the, at the base so that they are vertically supported. And uh, they are again connected through the wall on the both sides and then finally plastered. So this, this has been practiced uh, uh, on hundreds of buildings in Nepal since 2009. And during 2015 earthquake, uh, many of, most of these, these retrofitted buildings stood uh, without any damage while nearby reinforced concrete buildings were collapsed. Um, so this is complete uh, RC jacketing. While here, there is, a, uh, there is an effort to save the cost and material here, as you can see, this is, uh, this is uh, low density RC jacketing, where we have strips of the RC and jackets, splint and bandages. These, these look very similar to the confined masonry, but these are only on the, on the outer surface of the walls. And of course, again, on the both sides. So they are, they are, they are connected through the masonry. Again, on the global strengthening side, so the horizontal bands, the uh, seismic ties or belts uh, as known in some regions. So th these are also very effective in binding all the walls together and uh, imparting ductility to the structure. While these are being horizontal structures, they do not uh, really contribute to any vertical uh, lateral lateral strength. So th this is quite uh, hard to install uh, these these bands. So in new constructions, these are very easy to incorporate. But in retrofitting, so for example, in in this first case here, we need to first remove the existing roof structure, and then install this these bands roof bands, and again reinstall the roof structure. But in in older buildings, uh, this also provides a chance to retrofit or strengthen, upgrade your, your roof structure itself. So uh, it's a good uh, thing. And um, not complete uh, bands, but we can use seismic belts. So binding all the walls together uh, at, at the outer surface can also provide uh, global box-like behavior and uh, impart some ductility. In terms of roof strengthening, so this is not very structural, but this is also horizontal structures, which which helps uh, distributing the seismic forces uh, at the at the at the horizontal level. So, for example, in this first photo here, the 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 roof structure is without bracing. So we can install bracing to stiffen the the roof structure. So we have more rigidity uh, in its plane, um, and we can also improve the connection between the uh, roof elements within the roof elements, for example, using this metal nails or straps. Uh, this is in steel uh, building, a steel roof structure, where you can, uh, again, using the uh, diagonal X bracing, and this is in timber structure. So we can install diagonal braces and also strengthen the connections within the elements so that we stiffen the, the roof structure. Uh, about the roof and wall connections, so, these are walls, vertical walls, and the roof 
elements are resting on this wall. Uh, so in, in many cases, we have poor, poor uh, connections here, only uh, resting over the wall. So we can improve those by using these straps, nails, uh, we can dig holes and then put nails, but this is this requires skilled manpower as well as uh, as well as right tools um, for for these uh, strengthening works. About floor strengthening, so the horizontal floors in masonry buildings. So usually, traditionally, they are uh, they are timber uh, joist supported and uh, topped by mortar floor. So we can improve that by using these diagonal braces uh, um, in the horizontal plane. We can also put some plywood panels and nail this, those down to the, to the joists, or we can use concrete overlay, uh, reinforced concrete slab on top of the existing timber so that we stiffen the floor to, to better uh, distribute the horizontal action to the, to the, to the uh, lateral load supporting elements. Uh, on the same roof floor strengthening side. So for example, this floor is uh, a more topped uh, timber joisted floor. And here you can see this is a retrofitting. Uh, you can see there are slab strips installed at, at, at certain intervals and they are connected well to the ring beam and to the vertical strong backs. So we stiffen and uh, improve the connection of the floor uh, with the walls. Um, now we have seen some of the most commonly used techniques to strengthen walls, cross wall connections and the global building. Now we will see two examples um, supported by numerical analysis. And we will see in terms of uh, vulnerability and fragility functions, how we can, we can uh, improve the seismic behavior by strengthening. So the first case is a single storied school building. So this is brick masonry building. Uh, from, from Nepal. As you can see here, you can identify several deficiencies here. One most important deficiency is it lacks the, the seismic bands. So that is very important for the global box-like response. It also lacks the, the, uh, the proper diaphragm action. So um, these are some of the uh, characteristics of the building. This is a school building. The thickness is 250. English bond, so a good bond pattern, uh, no strengthening since its construction, and we don't see any horizontal bands. Uh, the, the requirement for retrofit design is that the building uh, should be uh, within the life safety performance limit. No, the moderate, because this is a school building, we, we impose uh, tighter safety regulation for schools because of uh, high importance factor. So we aim to uh, ensure that the building should uh, meet the immediate occupancy or moderate damage level after, after the strengthening. And this is in accordance to the uh, Nepalese seismic design code, NBC 105 2020. In, in Nepal, we have the, the code defines the seismic hazard to be 0.2Z to 0.4Z range. So those are the criterion criteria for the retrofit design. Um, so the retrofit design is, is uh, I have put here, should be safe as per the uh, light, uh, immediate occupancy requirements of the code. So before, re so for retrofitting as, uh, as seen in the uh, presentation uh, presented by Dina yesterday, she showed the comprehensive strategies for retrofitting. So. For the given building, we need to assess both qualitatively and quantitatively how much capacity or what are the failure mechanisms in the building are. So, so before retrofitting in the given existing building, we looked at uh, how the building behaves in during uh, during lateral action. So, in both in both directions, as you can see here, the outer plane walls, the walls acting in outer plane direction, they are most vulnerable and they tend to separate. Uh, out from the rest of the building. So the outer plane vulnerability here is the most critical, uh, and that is due to the lack of box-like behavior, which basically is due to the lack of the horizontal bands. And moreover, if we see the capacity curves here for clarity, I have plotted capacity curves of these outer plane walls separately 
end of the implant system separately. Implant system, the capacity, the base cell coefficient uh, is about 0 0.4, which is um, which can be compared to 0 0.4 G PG. While for the outer flange uh, walls, the capacity is only about 0 0.2 G, which is very low. So, so we have seen from the filler mechanism and capacity curves the the problem is the lack of box-like behavior and the, the high vulnerability of the outer plan walls. So again, in terms of fragility and vulnerability functions, the, for the given hazard of 0 0.2G to 0 0.4G, you can see the, the mean damage ratio, the loss ratio is more than 25% uh, to uh, up to 50%. So 25 to 50% loss ratio that is, uh, unacceptable for this school building. So, uh, so for the retrofit design, we, we because we have to imp improve the box-like response, we decided to install uh, a ring beam at the floor, roof level, which helps binding all the walls together. Um, for the, sorry, um, for the, for this retrofit task, uh, it is quite invasive because uh, we need to remove the uh, complete roof uh, and we need to re rebuild it after this, uh, this uh, ring beam installation. And there is a problem of connecting the ring beam to the walls. So we can, we can use the nails or straps at regular interval uh, for this, because if we had reinforcements coming vertically, then it was much. It would be much easier to connect this uh, with the uh, with the vertical structure. But there are none none in this building being unreinforced. So we need to use at regular interval nails or straps so that we get proper connectivity between the horizontal and vertical structure. So after retrofitting, if you now see look at the 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 failure mechanism uh, in the original structure as we saw already. The out of plan vulnerability is uh, the most critical one. But as soon as you install this ring beam here, then the, the failure mode switches into in plan failure modes. For example, the shear, shear failure here and the flexor failure here. And whole building acts as a single unit, single box, so that we can see a proper box like response here. And uh, if we compare the capacity curves here, the in plan capacity is not. Uh, significantly affected because we have not installed any vertical elements. However, the outer plan for the outer plan wall, the outer plan capacity was 0.2G before retrofitting, and it has now come up to 0.4G after retrofitting, which is significant improvement. Um, in terms of vulnerability function comparison for the original and retrofitted building, so we, we have the hazard range of 0.2 to 0.4G, so you can see in this range, the, uh, the original building, it had this much loss ratio. Mean damage ratio was up to 0 0.5%, uh, percent, uh, 0 0.5 or 50%. But as soon as you retrofit this building with the, this uh, technique, then your, your loss ratio is in the range of uh, 0.6 to uh, 0 0.7 to uh, uh, almost 0.15 or 14, 15%. So we have managed to reduce the loss for the given seismic hazard by 14, uh, 14 to 14% only. So uh, this is we, how we justify the, the retrofit design with detailed vulnerability assessment. So this building now uh, performs well within the given uh, performance requirement from the code. And the second case is a multi-story rubble stone masonry. So this is two story uh, plus uh, an attic floor here. The floor is mud topped um, uh, timber floor. Uh, this is again, the same hazard because this is also from Nepal. Uh, the, in terms of deficiencies, we can readily identify the poor quality of material, poor quality of mud, and mud is already lost here. Poor wall integrity, therefore, and uh, the poor cross wall connections. Although we can see some uh, larger stones here, but it's still, we need to improve the uh, cross wall connections. No rigid diaphragm action, although the, the, these floors um, 
provide some level, but not fully to the rigid diaphragm action. There is no box-like behavior because we don't see any ring beams uh, there. And the gables are heavy and highly vulnerable. So these are the deficiencies and we need to, and, and I, I want to briefly talk about this building type. So this building type is the most common building type in, in, the, in the mountainous regions in Nepal because of the local availability of the material. Uh, and in the last earthquake, 2015 earthquake, these buildings suffered the very high damage. Most buildings uh, uh, collapsed and under significant damage state. So the, these rates are all damage grade five, which is uh, collapse. So this is one of the retrofit examples that was implemented by build chains, and they have they have they have retrofitted over 200 uh, of such houses in the period of 2016 to uh, 2020. So, uh, so about the retrofit elements here, the design includes uh, the RC2 elements to improve the wall level integrity. As you can see here, uh, the design includes um, the vertically strong backs, reinforced concrete um, columns, which are uh, strong backs at the each, each corners, and at some certain intervals, okay. Um, and uh, there are RC ring beams installed, and and there are RC sl sl um, slab strips installed and connected to these ring beams as well as to these vertical columns. Um, so, as you can see, we have implemented the the three levels of uh, retrofit design. So, at wall level, at cross wall level, and at global level. So with these all retrofit elements, and also, sorry, the, 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 the heavy gable, masonry gable is now also replaced, okay, with, with light um, structures such as uh, CGI uh, seating. So if you compare the crack patterns, failure mechanisms of these two buildings, the, the existing and retrofitted buildings, in the existing building is, uh, as you can see, there is a complete diagonal crack developed throughout the wall length, okay? And also, so this is in-plane crack. And in terms of outer plane crack, uh, the, the, there is complete wall separation here and here, as you can see. So, and the seismic loading in this uh, transport cell direction, okay? Now, uh, in the retrofitted case, those, those cracks are broken, as you can see, as, as you also saw in the, uh, in the presentation by Juan Carlos. So these, these elements, these, these uh, two elements have, uh, and also the ring beams installed, they have acted as a barrier for the complete uh, full length crack development. So we have more time for the more deformation capacity, let's say, before collapse. So, uh, and also the, this complete vertical separation of the outer plane walls is also restricted. That is because of those ring beams and the, the of course, uh, the improved cross wall connections provided by the strong back. Here we have considered three, three different material qualities because those buildings have been built since uh, 80 years or they, 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 might uh, they might be 80 years old, 50 years old or 30 years old. So depending on that, we can, we can, uh, we can uh, assume different material qualities depending on the building age. So we considered three different material qualities uh, and this red all are belonging to the original building and the black colored ones are belonging to the retrofitted building. For, for now, let's look at the average material quality. So for the average material quality, the, the lateral capacity was only about 0.08 G for the existing building, while for the retrofitted building, it has improved up to nearly 0.2 G. So we have improved the lateral capacity by more than more than uh, double. Um, so in terms of fragility functions comparison, so we have the seismic hazard uh, uh, 0.2 to 0.4 G, and the, these are the fragility functions for the uh, uh, existing building, and these are the fragility functions for the retrofitted building. Uh, again, let's look at let's focus on these uh, bold lines, continuous lines, because that is the average quality uh, index building. So our aim, this is a residential building. So the code 
uh, requires us to meet at least life safety uh, performance level. So for life safety, so this 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 violet is the color for the life safety for the existing building for the entire range of PG the seismic hazard for 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 you can see this is reaching 100% probability. So we are 100% sure that this building will uh, perform beyond life safety uh, limit. So this is completely unsafe the structure. And again for the average quality, let's look at the continuous lines for the for the life safety performance level, you can see here the, the, the probability of uh, uh, being, the building being in the life safety limit is ranging from, uh, let's say 0.5% to 0. Point, sorry, 5% to 70%. So there is a drastic, uh, there is a, uh, let's say, uh, huge range of uh, the probability within that uh, small, uh, PG range. So, so here up to the highest le level of PG range, let's say 0 0.4, we cannot we cannot confirm it performs within the life safety. Okay. So, but in the in the lower PG range, depending on the reasons, uh, so we can we can see this is about 40 50 percent. So we can see in this range it 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 can perform satisfactorily. But if the metal quality is improved then this curve is here for the for the good quality material and this performs uh, sorry this one this performs well within the, for the given hazard range okay so the probability of being in the life safety is only about 5% but if the material quality is poor then then it has it is already from 55% uh, to uh, almost 100% probability so that is uh, we can say that is unsafe so this is how we, we can analyze uh, with the different material qualities, the before and after uh, strengthening and, and compare uh, against our seismic hazard, whether the intended retrofitting can provide the required safety level for the building. Uh, these are some of the key points. So uh, that's just a summary of what we discussed. So the assessment, both qualitative and quantitative, to identify the deficiencies in the existing condition is very important for designing any strengthening. Retrofitting needs uh, to be justified by several factors such as remaining life of building. If the building is expected to have five more years of uh, its life, then there is no point in retrofitting. We also need to identify how much cost it, uh, the retrofitting incurs, how much historical or cultural values the building has, and uh, also, on the how much how much uh, disturbance to our functionality uh, is is caused by the retrofit work, the retrofit design should be verified by detailed vulnerability assessment, as I saw uh, showed you in the uh, previous slides. The retrofit material and elements should be compatible and integrate well to the existing structure, as you also saw in uh, one Carlos presentations. Uh, care should be taken. Uh, to keep the disturbance to the original integrity of the building to minimal minimal uh, level. Skilled and trained manpower is necessary for retrofitting work because this is not new construction, but this, this needs more uh, careful attention while working, the, not, to, uh, in, not to be too invasive to the existing structure. And in term, in, in, if, if, if there is budget constraints, uh, then we can also implement incremental retrofitting where we uh, we install the retrofit elements at stages for example um, here you can install the three elements at one phase and in the next year or six months you can then install one by one but it, it also depends on other priorities for example if you if you because if you apply incremental retrofitting then you might be disturbing the functionality time to time but if you do all at once then you have only one time disturbance to the functionality of the building. And uh, that is all of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. Any questions, uh, please, uh, in the chat box or uh, open your mic. Thank you very much, Rohit, for this um, very interesting presentation of uh, how to compute the um, improvement 
be determined by the retrofitting and how to uh, consider that in a true the fragility function in probabilistic terms and therefore in the reduction of risk that is associated with that particular retrofitting typology. Is there any questions from the audience, please? Or comments or... If not, we can maybe uh, go on to a short break of mm -hmm. uh, three minutes, and then we will resume with the next lectures. Thank you. However, they, they, they represent the, the bonding, the, the uh, the shape or size of these stones, the quality of mort mortar is uh, very, very similar. So these are not assumed, but obtained from, from actual tests. Okay, um, any further feedback from Arturo? Otherwise, we will uh, go on to the next presentation from Dr. Rafael Fernandez, which is about uh, concrete frame structures retrofitting. Please, Rafael. Thank you very much, Tina. And thank you, Rohit, also for your previous presentation. As we have seen now in, in this course until until now, we have been focusing in you know, on reinforced masonry um, buildings. So we are now going to change a little bit and we are going to talk of RC um, buildings. So yesterday we saw different types of damages and how how these buildings have behaved in the in previous earthquakes. So based on that, we can identify the deficiencies and based on those deficiencies, then we can uh, assess the buildings and retrofit the buildings so they will have a better behavior. Uh, just to recall a little bit, we talk uh, uh, of this document, the FEMA 647, in which we have different type of deficiencies. The first one is global strength, when the building uh, does not resist a, a, a particular level of force that is uh, applied to it. We also um, discuss a little bit about global stiffness problems, where the structural relation between the displacement and the force that is applied is not enough. But there are so many other problems, such as configuration, some buildings with vertical or horizontal configuration that induce some type of torsional movements can then make the structure more vulnerable than, than it release. In addition to that, there are some additional problems, such as load paths, a, for example, buildings that have located some type of, of machines or some type of, of specific loads a, in some stories that make a, make the, the the behavior of the structure not as as expected. And there are others like inadequate component detailing. This was seen in many many previous earthquakes. A problem with the detailing of the of the rivers and diaphragm deficiencies and foundation deficiencies. We also saw some of those buildings that were tilted uh, because of problems with the foundation. And in those cases, and for each one of these deficiencies, there should be a re rehabilitation measure. And the FEMA 647 presents a correlation between them. And we are going to see throughout this presentation that relation precisely. And in relation to the rehabilitation measures, there are five main types or categories of rehabilitation measure. The first one is adding elements to existing building. So you, for example, have your building as it is with some particular vulnerability, then you can add some uh, shear walls to the to the building. And with that, you will uh, enhance the, the, the structural performance uh, of the general building. Uh, you will have a better behavior in terms of the strength and stiffness. Uh, other possibilities to enhance the performance of existing elements, for example, not to add any any shear wall or steel bracing, but to make the columns uh, to to give them a better um, characteristics. So with this this can be done through confining existing elements, and this confinement can be done with a concrete 
a confinement, a steel confinement, or even FRP confinement, as, as we're going to see in a moment. Other possibilities to improve connections between uh, components. Uh, you can also reduce the demand. If you isolate the base of the building, you will reduce the demand of, and, and the forces and the stresses that will uh, fill each one of the members. And in that sense, you can improve also the, the behavior of the entire building. And finally, removing selected components. So, for example, if you have an infill that is generating a sheer, uh, a short column shear failure, then if you remove that infill or if you isolate that infill at least, then you will have a better, a better behavior. Also, you can remove some floors, for example, reduce the load of the of the floors, and with that, you can also uh, improve improve the behavior. So, we're going to see by each one of the of the different uh, structural systems that we discussed yesterday. So in the, the, the first part of this presentation uh, are the reinforced concrete bare frames. In the FEMA 647, they are called C1, while in the glossy approach, they are called RC1. And um, these buildings are the ones that are composed, uh, that, are, um, that include uh, beams and columns as the main structural system. And it, it's the system that we withstand all the gravitational, but also all the lateral forces. In this case, the partition will not interact with, this, with these elements. So in this case, we can see this type of table in the FEMA 647, in which you will have in here the category. Uh, and for each one of the categories, a particular deficiency is specified. And for each one of the five rehabilitation techniques, a uh, suggestion is included. In some cases, like in here, you will have no recommendation because if the problem is, is a deficiency related to the global strength, improving connections between elements will not improve the, the, the strength, the general strength of your, of your building. In that sense, if we think about that problem of global strength and global stiffness, one of the most common approaches is to add new elements. And, and we are going to see in the next presentation a particular case in which this was done and how it behaved after after the Turkey earthquake. But in this case, for stiffness and strength, we can include, for example, shear walls, concrete or masonry shear walls. We can include steel brace frames, um, or or we can include any other type of of stiffening material that will uh, enhance the the lateral behavior of the building. In that sense, one of the most common approaches uh, of this adding new elements approach is to add shear walls. This can be implemented in spans, as you can see in this picture, or you can implement it as a buttresses in the exterior of, of the building. This implementation, of course, is easier in terms of, of, of you will not disrupt the, the, function, uh, the functioning of the building. Uh, but in some cases, it's better to, to add them between spans so the behavior will be better. Um, it, it, this approach has, of course, his advantages and, he, and, and its disadvantages. Um, usually, it's a little bit uh, difficult to ensure the attachment between the new steels and the existing concrete. Dr drilling these holes and and including some epoxy material is, is, is a time-consuming task, uh, but it requires only some traditional building skills. People usually know how to work with, with reinforced concrete, so it is it is possible to do even in, in, in rural uh, areas. One of the main problems of this is that it has a very high architectural impact. So if you, for example, uh, add a uh, shear wall, a concrete shear wall in one of these spans, then you will have practically a new, a new building because usually you don't need only to do this in this span, but also in some others, and you will affect the facade, and that's not um, uh, expected or, or is not um, wanted in, for example, heritage buildings. Here you can see some process, uh, some pictures of, of the process. You can see some e connections with the new steels and the existing steels over here. But you can also see from the pictures that this is a process that is not a trivial process. It, it, it takes time. Uh, these type of connections and holes are very complicated to do in field, but they certainly can be done. 
And in here, you can see a, a school building in El Salvador. This was a picture taken in 2018. And in here, you can see in this span uh, the addition of a shear wall uh, for, for retrofitting of this building. Other possibility is to include steel bracing. And these, these frames are uh, relatively easy to install. You only need to, to weld all the frame and then install it directly. So it has a relatively fast construction and the architectural impact is not that high because you can still um, maintain your windows and, and some openings over here behind the steel um, the steel brace. Um, the, the main problem of this is that some skills related to steel and welding are needed. So these type of skills are usually not found um, all across the, the countries, for example, maybe in an in a urban scenario, it will be possible, but if you are far away in, in a school, in a rural school, uh, in a developing country, there will be more complications in this installation. Here there are two videos of uh, a test that was done in Universidad Católica del Perú in 2016. They wanted to see the formation of the short column over here. So you can see in this in this uh, building, they try to do a, a, a school a school building. This is a classroom. Uh, in here, you have the restriction of the infills in both sides. So all the deformations will concentrate in this short part, and therefore the shear uh, the stresses will be higher than the capacity of the elements, and you will have that that type of damages. And uh, the other option was to um, retrofit the, the structure. So you can see in here um, a, a brace, a steel brace that was included in, in, in the building. And this helped with the, with the behavior. You can see now that the short column is not uh, forming over here. Uh, you have in this particular test one steel brace in this axis and one in the posterior one. So the behavior of the building for the same ground motion is, is much better. These are some pictures uh, that we took um, of this retrofitting of a building in Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. And they welded all the, the frame uh, infield and just besides the, the spans. Uh, and with this, then they install it uh, as, as you can see here over these walls, uh, the architectural impact was relatively low. You can see in here that from inside you can still see the, the bracing, uh, but it will not affect in any case the ventilation that is over here or any of the windows and the illumination. And here there's a table that was just temporarily uh, installed to protect uh, this part, but this was uh, taken down when, when the retrofitting finished. So you can see in here the process of installation, they just tilt it up and install it directly. Uh, other possibility when there's problems not with the strength of the steel or the stiffness of the complete building, uh, but with particular uh, elements is the component detail. So you can have problems related to a strong column and weak beam or problems associated with inadequate shear strength in the columns, which is the most uh, important, but also you can have that type of problems in the beams, uh, or problems with the splices, that the length is not enough. And in those cases, the solution is not to add new elements because you will still have a very weak existing element. So the solution will be the, the, the next rehabilitation technique that is in case existing elements. And that can be through the jacketing of, of, of existing elements. This could be done with concrete, with steel, or with some fiber polymer um, that, that, that can be used um, as, as we're going to see in a moment. So one of the main problems uh, is compression problems. As, as you know, unconfined concrete, as you can see in this picture, will behave much purely in comparison with confined concrete. You can see that the strength is lower, but also the ductility is lower in comparison to the confined concrete, as you can see. So you can add ductility with, with confining uh, existing elements. So this confinement can be done through concrete, steel, or FRP, as, as, as I just mentioned. In particular for the concrete uh, jackets, you will need to first 
roughen the existing structure then you need to install the new uh, steel over here all the confining loops uh, hoops and and the, and the vertical uh, bars as well and you need also to drill some dowels over here to connect the existing element with the new one so one of the most critical problems of this type of retrofitting is that you will have a larger cross section um, than the existing one so you will have an architectural impact inside uh, your building there are some complications you need for example to ensure a 135 degree hook uh, over here uh, so for that you will need to increase a lot the the, the section uh, but this this can be can be done um, it is very important that if the type of retrofitting is um, aimed to increase the actual capacity but not the flexural capacity then it's important to leave this type of gaps over here so the plastic hinge can develop uh, in 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 the element that you are analyzing that you're trying to retrofit other possibility that will not affect that much in terms of area of the of the of the element is uh, a steel jacketing uh, in here you will include some steel plates uh, with again some some drill dowels over here to connect this new uh, element with the existing one uh, the main problem of this is that this type of retrofitting is very heavy as, as you can imagine uh, all this steel covering all the columns in your in your building will add a lot of mass to to the structure and that will generate they may generate an additional deficiency so this needs to be um, considered when the retrofitting is designed uh, also you will need some specific capacities to weld this type of, of plates and to ensure that they will work as, as a confined element. Other possibility is to include um, these, these FRP um, bands. Uh, in, in this case, this, this type of bands work very good in circular columns because you will have the confinement of all the area of the building, of the column or, or element that you are analyzing. When you have rectangular columns, uh, the problem is a little bit more difficult. You first need to around the existing corners uh, and you need to ensure a, uh, a ratio of, of these of these uh, columns that is not greater than 1.5 uh, because if it is then you will have some parts that will not be confined uh, after the implementation of the of the FRP the main advantage of this type of retrofitting of course is that if you include this you will not have any impact in the in, in in the architectural part because you will not increase that much the section but also you will not add a lot of weight um, however this is, material is not perfect the behavior of the frp is usually an elastic behavior um, and a brittle with with a brittle failure so there is no ductility in this type of materials and um, even though the stiffness is usually higher or even or or at least similar to steel you will have some problems uh, in in relation to to ductility even though you can have a lot of this additional strength in this type of, of elements but the important thing in here is to consider that type of, of behavior of this uh, material you can do DFRP jacketing and any any type of jacketing, but the advantage of DFRP is that you can also install in different sections of the column, depending if you want, for example, to 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 confine a, the the concrete to a actual a capacity, or if you want to a, retrofit only because a problem of power splice um, a, enhancement, and in that case you will only add the FRP jacketing in the particular part of the bar splice, um, or you can improve all the columns in different in different uh, regions of the of the of the column. You can install it in, from the top to the end, and you will have a, a particular behavior. You can even leave some areas to to let the plastic hinge develop where exactly where where you want it to be developed. So what we saw until now is um, the the pair frames. Now let's see what happens with the masonry implants. Uh, in the FEMA six four seven, they are called C three. 
while in the glossy approach, they are um, considered as uh, RC2 and RC3. Um, in this case, as we saw also yesterday with, with the different building, with the damages in buildings uh, in previous earthquakes, one of the most critical uh, type of, of damages in this building is the failure of the masonry in field, uh, walls. And in particular, the out of the lane failure of these buildings that generate an additional threat to the to the human life. Um, on the other side, the in-plane uh, behavior will affect the structure and can generate problems uh, in in the existing elements. For example, a problem of short column. Um, so the first thing is to understand very well how the masonry infill affect uh, the performance. Uh, the first thing is that you will have an increase in lateral stiffness. So you can see in this pushover curve in the, with the continuous lines, the behavior of buildings with masonry infills and with the dotted line, uh, the behavior without considering the infills. So in the first part, you will have a, an, an increase in the lateral stiffness, but also an, an increase in strength. But, but after some point, when these infills start to fail, you will have a decrease in the capacity in terms of the strength, and you will have a damaged uh, frame. So the most important uh, problem uh, to be considered of this type of building is that you will have a reduction of the ductility in the structure. So this will generate some kind of brittle uh, behavior that is not wanted in this type of buildings, as we saw uh, with the capacity design approach. In that sense, it's very important to understand the failure modes, the in-plane failure modes and the out-of-plane failure modes. Uh, we have different type of uh, corner crushing, for example. We have central crushing over here. We can have um, this type of shear friction failure or some diagonal tension failure. Um, and out-of-plane, it will depend on how is the connection between the frame and the, the, and the wall. Uh, bro it explained uh, a bit of this uh, so we already understand how how is this behavior and in particular when we analyze this type of walls in, inside uh, a frame as you can see here what will happen with this frame is that you will have a behavior when you apply some lateral force uh, like this was a compressive strut if you have any openings the strut will behave something like like this but the most important problem of these struts is that an additional load that is not considered will be applied to this to the column over here. So you will have a different shear um, behavior and a different bending uh, moment behavior. So your column probably will not be designed to withstand this type of, of, of shear uh, behavior. Also, if the if these infills are located in different stories, you will have then an additional negative effect that this will cause some concentration of inelastic deformation uh, in the ones that you don't have any any infill. So, for example, the type of of um, deformation that you expect in this in this frame without any infill is something like this. But when you add an infill over here, which is pretty common. Uh, to, to leave the first floor, uh, for example, as a garage or, or, or as, a, as a commercial activity, then all the formation will be um, happening only in this, in this first story, and you will have the first story, the soft story mechanism that we saw previously in the, in the Turkey earthquake. Um, again, we can go to, to the FEMA 647 tables in which they relate the deficiencies with the rehabilitation techniques. Uh, and we can see here that if the problem is global strength, then we can do different alternatives, uh, such as adding new elements or enhancing existing elements. Uh, we already saw how uh, adding new elements uh, can be done through the implementation of steel braces or shear walls, and how enhancing existing elements can be done um, through, through the jacketing of, of columns and structural members. But, since in here we are talking about infill, uh, we can also enhance the performance of the infill to avoid, for example, out of plane failure and to generate a better uh, behavior uh, in, in plane. So this can be with this type of wire mesh uh, that will 
contain the the wall, um, so it will not it, it will not fail on out of plane and um, uh, an additional uh, retrofitting or, or implementation or, or intervention is to isolate the element over here, as you can see. So you they will not interact with the with the with the RC frame, but it will not fail out of plane thanks to the to the wire mesh. Here there are other rehabilitation techniques when the problem are, are load paths and component detailing. And you can see that there are possible uh, different ways of, of implementing this type of retrofitting. We we saw this type of mesh, but that can be also done with FAP or with shot grit or with ferro cement or, or any other type of, of, of material that will stick to the to the walls. Each of these materials have of course, a lot of advantages and disadvantages. FRP, for example, have a very high strength and stiffness and a very low weight, but uh, it has a lot of problems with anchorage. Uh, it does not dissipate any type of energy and the brittle um, mode of failure may be also a problem, while the short grit can dissipate some energy and the shear stresses can also be transferred uh, to, to, to the new elements. But on the other side, it will add a lot of mass uh, and maybe also impact the aesthetics of, of the, the building. So all of these advantages and disadvantages uh, should be considered uh, during, during this process. One thing that is very interesting of this type of retrofitting is the um, uh, retrofitting of joints. So this is usually a problem because it is very difficult to, to retrofit them, but you the, these elements are very important in a in a building, uh, so you can see that in some cases you can cut the masonry uh, over here, as you can see, and install an FRP uh, jacketing in the elements. But this, of course, is very complicated uh, to do, even though it is it is possible. Finally, in the last part of this presentation, there is the shear walls. They are called in the FEMA six four seven C two B or C two F while in the glossy approach, they are called RC4. As, as you may remember from, from the previous session, these are uh, elements or buildings with vertical elements as shear walls that can or, or cannot uh, have vertical uh, forces, uh, but all the lateral stiffness will be, will be um, sustained by these, by these elements. So these are used May a lot in, in high rise buildings. You can see these uh, buildings in Chile that were damaged after the 2010 earthquake. You can see this type of damages of buckling uh, of the rebar mainly in the in the in the in the end and the beginning of the of the wall. You can see that type of failure uh, across all the city of Santiago. And the main problem is that the deficiency of these element is that people build them with an adequate uh, wall thickness and only one curtain of reinforcement as, as you can see in here. So in this case this is not uh, ideal because you will not have any type of confined concrete over here. So all the behavior and the characteristics of your concrete will be of unconfined concrete and as we saw in previous uh, slides, this is this is very poor in terms of strength and ductility. So uh, after that, for the retrofitting of this type of shear walls, you can also go to the FEMA 647 and see the different um, suggestions uh, and recommendations. But what is mo most important to understand is that the damages will concentrate in this part of the of the walls. So therefore, one of the best retrofittings and in even uh, one philosophy of design of newly built uh, buildings with this type of walls is to add these uh, elements such as a column at the ends of the wall so they can withstand the compressive and the tension uh, strength when a lateral uh, element comes in a lateral force comes such as an earthquake. Uh, the walls also can be, can be retrofitted with some um, jacketing, with some FRP jacketing, as, as we already saw in, in previous slides. So you can see in here some example of this, in which uh, all the wall has been uh, covered with this. 
Uh, as you may recall, this is not effective for actual compression, but you can add some shear strength and also you will, you will uh, help uh, the behavior of, of in terms of flexion of these of these uh, well. Finally, just a brief example. Uh, if we have an original building such as this with short column and a low lateral resistance of the moment resistant frames, there are many possible uh, retrofittings, as you can see here, steel bracing, concrete walls, or concrete board buttresses. In particular, since in here we are talking about a school building, uh, time of implementation is very important. So in this case, one can select a steel bracing as the alternative. You can see the pushover curve of the original and the retrofitted structure when the original have a relatively low strength and a very low ductility, while the retrofitted uh, building will have much more uh, strength and a lot of more ductility. You can also see the fragility functions. You can see the original construction with a very high fragility uh, functions over here, but then the retrofitted one, you can move all those fragility uh, functions for different damage states. And you can also see that in the vulnerability function. As you can see here, a vulnerable right, vulnerability function with a vulnerability, while you can reduce that uh, in, in the retrofitted one. For example, for 1G, you will expect uh, less than 5% of damage in the retrofitted one, while for 1G, you will expect uh, almost 70% um, of damage in the original structure. So just to finish this presentation, beside the technical uh, issues of, of rehabilitation, there are also some non-technical issues that should be considered. So these usually determine which type of retrofitting you need to implement. Uh, the first one usually is the cost. The second is the seismic performance. What type of risk is acceptable? For example, if we are talking of a residential building, is different than if we are talking on a, a hospital. Uh, so we need to see what is the, the acceptable level of hazard. Uh, then we have some short-term disruption to the occupants, the long-term functionality of the building, and also aesthetics in terms of historic preservation. So these are all the, the considerations that needs to be considered when, when, when you're planning a retrofitting. It's not just choosing one of the, the ones that we saw previously, but also to consider all the impact of this decision, all the impact that this will have on, on, on your project. Thank you very much. Um, this was the RC part. Now I will give the word to- Thank you very much, Rafa. Thank you. I don't Thank know you. if there is any quick questions or considering we are 10 minutes from four o'clock, maybe we can pass directly to the presentation by Asana and then we can have some discussion at the end. That's great. Thank you. Ina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Rafa. Let me share the screen. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think we have already had a very good um, uh, overlook or overview of all the possible um, or different techniques of retrofitting uh, RC structures in the last presentation. This is a specific case of a, um, of a residential building um, block from Antakya, Turkey. Um, as uh, we're all well aware by now um, about the two earthquakes that happened in February uh, 2023, the first one with a 7.8 magnitude to the west of Gaziantep and uh, the second one following uh, just nine hours later further north. Um, so um, we are talking about Antakya, which is in Hatay province, um, which I will come a bit more detail a bit later. Um, as we have seen in several reports and uh, reportings by now that the the region that is exposed is highly uh, complicated, a complex tectonic system, um, uh, which is a combination or a, or a joint of three different plates, boundaries coming to um, uh, having a, a very complicated uh, mechanism of tectonics happening. Um, this uh, particular um, uh, building was assessed during a field mission to the earthquake affected areas uh, by IFIT 
Um, this was a, as a hybrid mission led by um, professors from UK and um, several people joining from Turkey and other countries, uh, contributing to different areas of this earthquake, such as the seismotectonics, um, geotechnical structures and infrastructure aspects of, uh, of the earthquake. Um, we visited the area of uh, Antarctica on second day, where we are going to see this particular building. So if we look a bit more in detail to the Antarctica city, this is one of the most uh, severely affected uh, um, areas in this earthquake, with uh, more than 3,000 buildings collapsing and several others to be demolished, um, uh, more than 20,000 casualties and several of these buildings being built before um, the modern seismic codes in place. Um, they were having deficiencies for, for the kind of earthquake that occurred. Even um, if you see the PGA uh, that was recorded, it is uh, also in areas such as Antakya, it's higher than the highest seismic zone um, designation, such as 0.4G, um, which is, uh, which is the cause of uh, the heavy destruction that uh, that is experienced, and um, and beyond that, another consideration is that this is a very densely populated area, uh, in in a, in a soil that is in a soft soil that, uh, by the side of the river, which also would have led to the amplification of ground motions. Um, so in that city where a lot of destruction happened, there was one building that uh, came uh, out to be still standing and um, uh, as a very good example of um, a, a good performance in this earthquake. And uh, this has been now quoted as an example and being carried uh, to other cities for, uh, for their retrofit of uh, deficient structures. And we are talking about this particular building, uh, Antakya Municipality Residential Block A2, which is on the left of this figure. Um, this was part of a complex with three blocks. You can still see the two blocks that are standing. There was a third one in this empty space, which had to be completely um, demolished and taken away because it did not uh, survive the earthquake. Um, the building on the left, the A2 block, um, all of them were built uh, about 50 years ago. Uh, they were basement plus nine floor buildings with about 400 square meters square in each floor uh, area. This particular building A2 was retrofitted um, in 2008-9 um, as, a, as a very specific project by the Middle East Technical University and Istanbul Technical University. Um, which uh, took up this project of assessment of the existing building, uh, its deficiencies, and then designing retrofit using CFRP and uh, RC shear walls. And looking at this process, the uh, from the site, we were told that the residents in the, the other block, the Avon block, they were also interested in uh, strengthening their building. And this was partially retrofitted. This was uh, retrofitted only in the ground floor using only the CFRP technique. So this also survived the earthquake. Uh, however, um, uh, it was subjected to much severe damage than the, uh, the A2 block. And the A3 block was nowhere to be seen uh, by the time we visited the site in March 2023. So we will look a bit more um, into the A2 block and see the kind of retrofit that was implemented and uh, a bit more information on this building from the study um, carried out at METU. So um, the initial assessment of A2 uh, revealed uh, through some material testing and the, some analytical studies on simplified models uh, suggested that it was uh, deficient for the most uh, modern seismic codes, the Turkish Earthquake Code of 2007, through a demand to capacity uh, assessment uh, at member level for each RC column and beam, and um, uh, also through a global performance evaluation by counting all the failing members. So 
and uh, it, since it was built in 1974, 74, 75, uh, the, the reinforcement use was plain bars and the strength of concrete was also quite low. So they designed uh, retrofitting using two techniques. So it's a hybrid retrofit using external RC shear walls and CFRP on masonry infills and internal columns. So the first uh, approach of CFRP, as we have seen in the previous presentation, this is to augment the um, the infill panel, um, the the uh, compression and tensile tensile capacity of the infill panels. So as we saw, the the masonry infills in RC frames they act as a diagonal strut under the lateral load. Uh, the added CFRP retrofit they are um, intended to act as the tension ties so together they can you can they can have the intended effect of uh, under a uh, bidirectional force so uh, overall it is uh, expected to reduce the interstory deformations uh, while improving the load carrying capacity and also improving the lateral stiffness so this was uh, the kind of application uh, that was designed. They would have the strips in the di both the di diagonal directions, and they would have uh, anchorage to the RC beams and columns using CFRP anchorage. Um, and they would also have uh, cross wall connections. So with this, uh, the, this is referring to a, a laboratory study using CFRPs. There has been a lot of studies on uh, on the effect and the improvement of, that is obtainable by the CFRP. Just as an example, I'm quoting this study um, uh, and to observe how they how they behave under lateral action. So this study, for example, was uh, um, shown to have um, shown to improve the capacity of, of um, un unretrofitted walls, as you can see from the purple curve to these red and green and blue curves and the variation uh, among these curves are basically the material properties of the RC and masonry that is in the frame. So in, uh, in every case we can see that there is substantial improvement in their load bearing capacity and it further reduces the, the lateral deformation of the frame. So um, it is also, in addition to the tensile uh, capacity improvement, it also improves the comp compression uh, uh, capacity because it keeps the masonry intact um, while uh, the action, uh, while the, uh, um, uh, but again, at the same time, while this is okay, uh, it, the CFRP is found to buckle under the compression load and the subsequent tension um, cycle would snap the um, the CFRP. As mentioned in the previous presentation, the brittle failure mode of CFRP is one of the uh, shortcomings of this technique. But uh, however, um, even with a failure of a few fibers or strips, CFRP was still able to um, uh, continue the load transfer until the very um, last failure, which occurred at very high uh, deformation ranges such as uh, one percent drift ratios. So it is uh, an effective um, and very less invasive um, 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 retrofitting technique because it doesn't uh, always require uh, people to be removed for a long period of time. So in this particular building, that the A2 block, this was applied on the infill walls in uh, within the RC frames, as I mentioned. And also they, were, they found that several columns in the basement was uh, corroded um, and these columns had to be also retrofitted and then they were given a coating of CFRP um, uh, in the columns. Um, and in addition to the CFRP, the second uh, technique applied was additional uh, shear walls, which were external to the building and attached to the existing RC frames. Um, as you can see through these anchor roads um, and um, uh, through this technique of, um, uh, of uh, shear walls. So these were uh, designed in a combined uh, manner such that combining these two techniques, both these uh, CFRP retrofit on the masonry infills and the shear walls, they would together provide balanced strengthening in both X and Y directions. So 
this was then implemented inside some from um, uh, some photos during the construction stage and this was after the earthquake so as you can see the building is very much standing um, and people were able to evacuate and um, safely from the building so the retrofit was uh, intended for the life safety performance level of the of the uh, expected earthquake at the location where which it was able to uh, perform and as you can see in these figures, these uh, additional shear walls are still very visible on the exterior of these buildings. And you can see this building, other components such as unretrofitted masonry infills have, uh, have undergone um, damage still. Um, and uh, because this was also um, studied analytically, it was able to see that the, the uh, unretrofitted buildings, uh, which had a heavy deformation in the ground floor, was uh, was able to restrain the re deformation within the code limits of TEC 2007 through this retrofit technique. And uh, the capacity curves as obtained from the original and the retrofitted cases suggest the improvement in capacity up to three times, three folds. Um, this was uh, this is uh, about this particular building and if you if you are interested in knowing more about the mission and other buildings and other aspects that we have looked into you can see the mission lecture here and um, thank you for your attention and this particular study is also um, uh, part of this uh, publications here so you can have a look if you're interested thank you for your attention if you have any questions i will be happy to take Thank you very much, Asana, for a swift and very interesting presentation on a real case, which has clearly been tested well beyond the level of design that was meant for. Um, are there questions? Everything was so clear. Or oh, there is too much to digest. So um, as we have already gone a little bit uh, beyond the time, and we will not uh, keep you any longer, but please feed us back with comments, uh, opinions, what you would like us to uh, broadcast next, whether you have a lecture or uh, some ideas in mind of people that can be uh, included in these uh, activities, please, and that can uh, present themselves, either you or your colleagues, please uh, let us know. Um, Raphael is sharing a website. Yes, Dina, this is a questioner. If you, before leaving, can click and fill it, it will be very helpful for us uh, just to see how we can improve a uh, future courses. Thank you. Yes, so this is a very quick survey. It takes five minutes, five questions, um, or you can write for hours on end if you want. But uh, please let us, we are really looking forward to your feedback. Um, so there is a question. Uh, thank you very much. In which software do you model the retrofitted structure? I think structures. I think this is for both uh, maybe uh, Rafa and Ruit. Um, can you expand a little bit on that? Yes, Dina, if, if you want, I can start. A, in yes, particular, for, for RC buildings, there are many softwares that can be used. A, one of the most common one uh, that is used for, for design is Aptos Mill uh, as well. A, in this software, you can also develop pushover for the original and retrofitted condition. Uh, but has some limitation. Uh, if you are more interested in doing something academic and more technically advanced, uh, then OpenSeas would be a much useful um, software. So, yes, so um, Raphael, you can we did in, uh, indeed do a course on uh, an initial um, sort of course for dummy on OpenSeas last year, uh, about this time, a bit later in May. Um, 
we, if again, if there is interest in the audience, we can perhaps uh, organize instead a course on uh, uh, SAP or other uh, software. We, you can also use the Seismos Rat. The issue is really what, you know, OpenSeas is clearly open source uh, or ETADS for that matter. Um, open seas is open source, but it requires more uh, knowledge of programming, uh, while the other one are commercial packages. So it will depend, they cost some money to use. It depends whether you have access or not to them. But uh, again, this could be, for instance, some feedback that you can send us if you are interested in that aspect of the uh, of the procedures of determining capacity curves, we can certainly do a crash course on SAP or, or ETADS uh, to uh, bring you to speed on that aspect. Uh, there is a question here, if they will face due to foundation uh, settlement, then how to repair it? Who wants to answer that? I can I can give a first um, yes. answer and then you can complement Dina. Um, well, the, the foundation settlement and in general failure of foundation is one of the most critical uh, problems uh, with, with existing buildings because it's very difficult to, to repair if the problem is about settlement but not but settlement of the entire building then you can uh, for example add a uh, some additional type of, of a uh, deep foundation with with some special machinery but but to try to stabilize the the building when the problem are differential settlement uh, in the building then you will have an additional problem because you need then to try to bring it uh, and, and delete the, any tint of of the building so it is very expensive even though it's possible very expensive and it's very difficult difficult to do so I think that it can be repaired if the settlement is, is small and if it's a, in, in similar settlement in all the buildings. If it's differential, it's much more complicated. Yes, I think that, and also it depends whether the settlements is cause, <clears throat> is a co-cause of the earthquake or it's a pre cause of the earthquake. So if the settlement was already there and there is uh, pre-damage, uh, then of course the building should be uh, repaired, especially if it's a masonry building, this will show up very clearly in diagonal cracks, for instance, of vertical cracks in the masonry. Uh, there are various methods of uh, repairing it. We can provide some references, but basically uh, it's a matter, very often it's a matter, first of all, to fi of fixing the foundation and then to uh, repatch the misery with uh, what we call uh, in Italian cuci scucci, which is basically removing the bricks around the crack and repositioning the bricks with new uh, mortar, confident mortar and enforced so that that is resolved very often. And then you just re-establish the flow paths of the gravitational uh, load down to the foundation and the problem is solved. If instead uh, it's a cone cause of the earthquake, then again, depends very much on, you might need to underpin the foundation, you might need to consider the quality of the soil. So for instance, in uh, Turkey, uh, we have seen this both in the earthquake in 1999 and in the earthquake, in the, in the recent earthquake, building have actually sunk almost uh, uh, horizontally uh, into the ground because the soil underneath is extremely uh, weak. It's very sandy soil, although not necessarily associated with liquefaction. So the, the, the water table might not be so high, but still the soil is quite uh, uh, weak and uncohesive, and therefore uh, this can occur. Um, in that case, again, it's an issue, first of all, of soil remediation, but it's also an issue of how then you re-jack up the building, and very often in this case, the building cannot be uh, re 
rehabilitated or recuperated or salvaged. Yeah. Any other question? I just wanted to add to that, Dina. There were cases, I think, in the previous earthquake in Turkey where they had to, even though it was possible to do it, but because of the cost constraints, it was easier to let the building go. And then, exactly. yeah. The ground uh, case, foundation the retrofitting. The well. yeah. Can you consider soil structure interaction in the retrofitting procedure? Yes, definitely. They, in the same way that you can consider soil structure interaction when you are designing a building, you uh, should do uh, an assessment of the building as it is with the soil structure interactions, and then you can model the strengthening either at foundation level or at, in the upper structures and run the analysis again and see what. Uh, um, improvement that has made. Of course, uh, very often when you're doing soil structure interaction, the interest is to move the uh, period, the natural frequencies of the structures from the amplification that the soils provide. So uh, uh, that um, it would be uh, uh, one of the things that you would look into. So the type of strengthening or the type of retrofitting that you would look into it. Uh, would then uh, associate with the idea of, uh, of shifting the periods to safer and less uh, high and you know, uh, smaller amplification of the uh, incoming action up to the uh, possibility of uh, providing um, isolation, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted oh, to. Oh, there is. A, yes. Sorry, Rui. Yes. That's okay. I just wanted to briefly say about uh, the masonry modeling. I have sent you a link there of uh, the software and approach. Uh, it's called Applied Element Modeling, which is a branch of discrete element modeling because masonry is a discrete assemblies of units uh, bonded by mortar. So the applied element is uh, more efficient in that sense uh, for mas masonry modeling. Um, you can check the link I have provided uh, to, to find out more about the method as well as uh, they have presented some verification examples and so on. Um, the, this software uh, called Extreme Loading for Restructures, it has all the uh, formulations of the applied element method and can be used. The, the, the graphical user interface is very similar to SAP 2000 or any other uh, CAD-based software programs. Yes, one of the limitations of this extreme modeling software is that it's quite expensive, but there are indeed yes. uh, um, academic and student uh, uh, license that you can request. And the student license, I think, it's not, it doesn't allow you for huge model, but uh, you can still at least become familiar with the way of modeling. Yes, and you can even ask for a trial uh, version for a couple of weeks or a month if you request them, they will uh, provide you a trial license so that you can try yourself. Yes. And similarly for the SAP 2000. So I see that there is some interest in a crash course in SAP 2000. We can definitely uh, try to organize that. It would be good if you uh, respond to our survey so that we can uh, sort of uh, gauge, you know, number of interested people, and because that is a very much hand-on uh, course, and therefore we need to organize ourselves uh, more than just with a simple talk or a, a, let's say one-way talk, like in this case. Okay, guys. Um, any other questions or comments? Then, in that case, thank you all very much for attending again, and uh, we will uh, soon let you uh, inform you of the new program that we are that we are developing for the season. Thank you again, and bye bye everybody. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. See you again. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.